Poker is a game of decision making under conditions of uncertainty for those who here, weren't here yesterday. What that means is that there are several decision points during a hand, but you can't see your opponent's whole cards. Um, and this is really what all the problem in poker is about. Your problem at the table isn't like how to win money. It's not how to win the most hands. It's not any of those things. Our goal at the table is to reduce uncertainty and make our decisions easier at all times, right? So we're in this situation where we have hidden information from us. It's not like chess. Chess is a game where you can see everything, much easier game than poker. Uh, in poker, you can't see everything. But the idea is that if we can make our decisions easier by, uh, you know, by reducing uncertainty, and we can make our opponents make bad decisions, uh, then we're going to probably be winners in the end, and that's what our goal is. So money's not the goal. That just happens to be the fallout from good goal setting and decision making. Uh, money's actually only the scorekeeper. It's the way we keep score. Today, we're going to talk about uh, this issue of how do you play these monster hands on the flop? Um, and, and again, we're going to look at it from a different standpoint than you've probably heard in the past, which is about this decision making problem and what does your decision set look like. So we're going to talk specifically about how you play sets and how you play big draws, but we're going to talk about it um, very specifically in the case of the set where the board is highly coordinated, right? So what you can see here is that uh, we've got two nines and the board is ace, ten, nine, two spades, right? So that's going to be the first situation we're going to talk about. Here's the interesting thing. So let's, let's say that we were looking at this board and the board was ace, nine, three, no suit. Okay, so a different board than this. Just ace, nine, three, no suits, and we flop the set of nines. How many hands could beat us right at this moment? One, right? Two aces. Now, what you need to think about, because we can't see the other player's cards, okay, what your decisions are going to look like is going to have to do with how this decision space is defined. How big is my decision space? And this, how big your decision space is, it just has to do with how many possible hands are out there that my opponent could have and beat me with, right? So if the board's ace, nine, three, no suits, and you flop a set of nines, your decision space is very small, right? There's exactly one hand that can beat me. Now, here's where it gets really important because what poker players don't do enough of is thinking ahead. So in this particular situation where we have ace, nine, three, no suits, we want to think ahead. Our, what kind of cards on the turn could really ever drastically improve, uh, increase our decision space when the board's ace, nine, three? Is there anything that really drastically increases the possibilities for what the other person's holding that could beat us? Not really, right? Like if a jack, a ten jack, queen, or king comes, okay, they might make a set, but that only goes to two, right? So there's never, there's not too much about the board that's going to cause our decision to be drastically more difficult on the turn than it is currently on the flop. Do you guys see that? Right. So whatever our sort of decision matrix is, is we're sort of trying to figure out how we're navigating against the other player, is not going to look very different no matter what the card is on the turn. Right? And so that's an interesting situation because what it means is that when you have hands like three nines on an ace nine three board, we have a lot of choices about how we play the hand because we can court, we, if we wanted to slow the hand down, we could. Because the turn's never going to look very different from the flop, so we're not really going to cause ourselves any problems, okay? Does anybody have any questions about that? Because it's important to set that. Okay, great. So here's, let's look at this board instead. And let's ask, what does our decision space look like on the turn? What's it likely to look like? Now here, we're in a very similar situation. At the point that we flop three nines, if we stop the hand right here, there's only two hands that can beat us, right? Three tens or three aces. So what we know right now is it's almost definite. It's, it's almost as definite as you can get in poker that you absolutely have the best hand right now. Right? That's why we're calling this a monster. You almost for sure have the best hand right now. So it's the same thing as when you have ace, nine, three, right? We almost definitely have the best hand. But our decision looks a lot different here, even though the hand is still just a set of nines. So what kind of cards would be really bad for us to see on the turn here? A spade. Okay, great. So, so we know that the king of spades, queen of spades, jack of spades, eight of spades, seven of spades, so on down, right? I'm, and the ace of spades is actually not great for us because if someone hits the ace of spades, they could have ace 10 or ace 9, right? And that's a little bit hard. So all nine spades are bad. That's nine cards. Can someone keep track of these? Someone write nine down on their pad. Okay, because I want to say. Now, what about, are you happy if you see an eight? No, right? Because now all the queen, jack, and, right, okay. So put down three eights because we already counted the eight of spades. I don't want to double count cards. So now we've got nine plus three, right? What about a seven? 
Not really. We aren't particularly happy with a seven, right? So we got three of those. Uh, what about a jack? How do you feel about a jack? Yeah, right? Queen, king? Not so much, right? That's particularly bad. By the way, those king, queen, jack are really bad if you have a hand like ace-10 here, right? When ace-10 is pretty much as good as three nines, right? So those are similar hands. But with ace-10, the problem's even bigger because then king, queen, jack is really, really bad, right? When you have three nines, you have to worry about those straights, though, because people tend to be holding those kinds of cards. So king, queen, jack, we've got to add nine more cards there, right? And then, you know, you really kind of have to throw in the 10 as well, right? Okay, so we've got three of those. So how many does that add up to? And the six is kind of bad. Let's, you know, there's, there's three six. Let's just count one of the sixes. So someone add that up for me. How, what? I think it's less than 27. Okay, so 27. Now let's talk about how many cards are left in the deck here, right? You know about your two cards. You know about the three on the, the flop, right? That's five. There's how many cards are in the deck? 52. So there's 47 cards in the deck, and 27 of them are bad for you. That's over half. Now let me explain what I mean by bad for you. I don't mean that every time one of those 27 cards hits, you're beat. You know, obviously that's absurd, okay? It's not that a, a, this individual right here with his cards face down, you know, can be holding all 27 outs. It has to do with the fact that since you can't see your player's cards, anytime one of these cards hits, so let's look at a really bad card like a jack of spades, right? It's a very, very bad card in the deck for you. Anytime one of those cards hits, your decisions are going to be much, much, much more difficult for a variety of reasons. Number one, the person might actually have beat you, right? They might actually have king, queen, or spades, okay? So, so that's really bad because they might have actually beat you, but we're not so concerned about that. We're concerned about the stuff where we don't win pots that we're supposed to. If you take it from the standpoint of someone who has a hand like ace-king offsuit here with no spade in it, on the flop, you can get paid by that hand, right? Ace-king has no reason to believe here on the flop that they don't have the best hand, correct? But once that jack of spades hits, does ace-king offsuit no spade ever pay you? No. So what's interesting is that because of what happens in terms of the explosion of the decision space, you have to remember that that explodes back for your other player as well. Right? So the guy with ace-king offsuit, you're, you look at a two-fold problem. Only two things can happen to the guy who has ace-king offsuit. Either he decides to bluff you and he takes a pot away from you, or he folds and you lost money because you didn't get the money from him at the point that he could call you. Okay, does that all make sense? Good. Okay, so this is a really important thing for you to think about when you're playing a hand of poker on the flop, is I understand what the space looks like right now, but I gotta think about what's this space likely to look like at my next decision point. And people don't really think about that, right? What they think is, I have a set, right? They look at it, oh, I have a set, I wanna get a lot of money from my opponent, right? And they're not thinking about what the real problem here is, is what, what am I gonna be doing on the turn here? What's my decision gonna look like on the next street? Okay, so, I wanna talk about the all-in decision here because this relates very heavily to what, we're, what we just said, because it's going to give you a good idea of how to deal with these situations. And by, you know, in all in, I can also mean like big bet, like making a big raise or, you know, those kinds of things. All right. So it turns out that playing the flop fast, in this case with a set, don't worry about the draw yet, playing a flop fast on, on the, uh, when you flop a set on a board like this makes a lot of sense because, and this is what's really important, you're equally happy no matter what the result is. So this is what I want you to think about. The all-in decision, at least, you know, really before the river, but even on the river, that decision to go all-in, you know, assuming that you have chips and you're not a nub, which if you're, you know, if you have that many chips, you're going to go all-in because that's a bet. But assuming that you're consciously making a decision to make a very large bet at the pot, that decision only makes sense when you don't care what the result is. Okay? So let's think about that on that kind of board. And let's think what it looks like here. If you make the huge bet on the flop and your opponent folds, should you be unhappy about it? No. If you're unhappy about it, you're choosing greed, right? Yeah, I mean, because greed is, so, so do you see, the, the reason why you're not unhappy if you make a big bet here and someone's folds, is that you've avoided this whole problem on the turn then, and that's very desirable to you. So it doesn't matter that your hands are set, because it doesn't look, it's not actually as strong as it looks to you, because the decision is going to be so hard on the turn. 
So the point here is you want to deal with this hand at the point where you know your hand to be strong and you're not vulnerable to all the things that can happen on the next card. So if I move it and you fold, that's awesome. I got the goal because I understood what my goal is. I don't want to make any more decisions. If I move and you call, that's awesome. I have the best hand and I don't have to make any more decisions. Even better. Um, now the other thing that's kind of interesting about this is that this, when, you, when you make this big bet on the flop, it also happens to be the time that you're most likely to get called by a flush draw. Which is awesome because this is a point at which obviously you're a big favorite against a flush draw. You're a huge favorite. The flush draw wouldn't be getting the right price here because they, they'd actually be getting like less than two to one if you're over betting the pot. And what happens if the deuce of diamonds hits on the turn? Does the flush draw pay you off anymore? No, right? So here, this is the point where you're most likely to get money from ace king. It's also the point where you're most likely to get the money from the flush. Um, okay, so what you can see is with a set on a textured board, the decision space explodes on the turn. So your goal is to end the decision making on the flop. Okay, so that's the. So now let's look at out of position. Okay. So in position, you know, if somebody bets into you, you're just going to make a big bet, right? If they check to you, you're going to make a pretty big bet there. Now out of position, it's going to kind of depend on who was the pre-flop raiser, because we always have to think about where's that lead that we talked about yesterday, right? Who has that lead? Because you have this kind of natural action at the table of I check to the raiser, I check to the raiser, I check to the raiser. So let's say that you weren't the raiser before the flop, okay? If you're not the raiser before the flop, well, Here's the big thing. You don't want to give a free card because this texture is working against you, right? So you can't give a free card. But if you were not the pre-flop raiser, the other guy has a natural continuation bet, right? So you can check to him. Now you're going to check to him. He's going to bet. What can you do? Raise, like your eyeball, right? So you're going to make a nice big check raise there and try to get that hand over with, particularly out of position, okay? Great. So when the other guy has the lead, you can do this very natural check to him and allow that hand to play out that way. Now, if he doesn't have the lead, it's a much dicier situation, right? If you're the one with the lead, you have the natural bet, okay? But the problem with that is that if you lead out, it might only be for one bet. And then you're going to have to see a turn. So, but you can't give a free card, so that's kind of a conundrum, right? It's like a puzzle, an enigma. So here's the problem, like you don't want to see the turn and if you continuation bet, maybe he's just going to call your continuation bet, which is going to cause the turn to fall. But if you check, maybe you're going to give a free card. So this is where you always want to think about your opponent, right? It's the reason why I can't give you rules for things. Um, the reason why you want to think about your opponent is you want to say to yourself, is this a guy who always bets when I check? You know those guys, right? You've played against those guys, right? If I check, he bets like 100% of the time. That's probably a good guy to check the lead away against. Right? So you raise before the flop, he calls, the board comes this, and you're like, oh, that's that guy who always bets when I check, I check. And he's going to bet, and now you can check raise. Okay? If he's not that guy, you better bet this hand and go, I hope he raises me. You know? All right? So that's what you want to be thinking about as you're trying. So, so here's the key. It's not about, am I always supposed to continuation bet? You know, am I always supposed to keep the lead? Am I always supposed to do that? It's, what's my goal with the hand? If my goal with the hand is to somehow try to get a raise in, then what's the best way for me to do that, right? If I'm in position, I'm, I'd really like the guy to lead into me. That would be awesome, right? But if I'm out of position, now I've got to figure out what's the best way for me to get a raise in. Well, the best way for you to get a raise in is to check raise. So then you just got to think, is he going to bet for me? That's the next question. Is this guy going to bet for me if I check? And if the answer is yes, you should always check. And if the answer is no, you should always bet. Because you don't want to give a free card either. So it's about setting your goals properly, and that will always get you to the right answer against your given opponent. So now we're going to look at a very similar kind of board, right? This board isn't that different than the other board. 10-6, uh, deuce, two spades. But now you've got ace, king of spades. Okay, so now we've changed it up. So there's three components that make this hand big. I have a flush draw. I have two overs, and I'm going to see two cards. So, what do you think your goal with this hand should be? To see two cards. Exactly. So, see, it's, poker's not, like, too complicated once you understand how to navigate a decision, right? So, if what makes this hand a monster is that, I'm, uh, is that I've got two cards to come, then your goal should be to make sure that you have two cards to come, right? So if you allow the turn card to come off here, now you only have one card to come. Okay, great. 
So that causes a lot of problems because if it's a bust for you, you could get bet out of the hand, right? And all of a sudden now you're a two to one dog or more, right? Um, but here's the other problem is that if the spade comes, can you get paid off? I mean, your opponents are hyper aware that there's spades on the board, right? They always are. That's the problem with flushes, right? So when the spade comes, is it easy for you to get paid off now? No, right? So it's both of those problems, right? If you let the turn card come off, it's the same problem with the set. You might lose the pot now, right? And if, you, and, and if it happens to complete the texture, you might not get as much money out of your opponent as maybe you deserve. Okay, great. So um, playing the flop fast here in the case of a big draw makes sense because, again, you're equally happy if your opponent calls and you're equally happy if they fold. Doesn't matter to you which way it goes because a lot of the deck here is either going to help your opponent or it's going to kill your action. That's what we've been talking about. So in here, this hand is only a monster if there are two cards to come. So make sure you see two cards. And here's the deal. The special bonus to this hand is that you don't have to make the flush to win because your opponent might fold on the flop, right? And you're more likely to get paid off when you do make the flush. Let's say that this guy bets and he's got jack-10, right? And you now make a big raise. It's very hard for jack-10 to call you, right? That's a really good result for you, right? The 10 folded. That's pretty awesome. Now, if they have ace-10, that's even better for you because against ace-10, you're even money, right? Okay. So, so really, when you move in, almost all hands are at risk of folding, except for really jacks, queens, kings, aces, and sets. So that's not too bad. If he bets and he was the preflop raiser, that's awesome. You can raise him. Um, but, and and if, if obviously, if you were the preflop raiser and he bets, you could raise him. Um, and if you were the preflop raiser and he checks, you would bet. But here's the kind of weird situation. If he raised before the flop and he checks, that's weird, right? That's kind of, it's kind of a weird thing to do because people who raise before the flop bet, right? Especially out of position. So if he checked, what, is that, what do you think that means? He's probably trying to check raise you, right? He probably has a big hand. He's trying to be tricky. So against the big hand, you're actually not supposed to be a favorite. So in that case, you can check because you might as well try to make the flush, right? So always think about that. If a guy raised before the flop and then all of a sudden checks to you, it's a really good time with this hand to check. But with that hand, that's a great time to bet because you want him to check raise you because you actually have a better hand than he's planning to do that to you with. So now let's look over here to the out of position situation. So now remember, if you had, if you had the set on this kind of board, you asked yourself a very simple question, right? If I check, will this guy bet for me? That's, that's the question you're supposed to ask. The answer is yes, you should always check to them because you want to get, you want to be able to check raise. If the answer is no, you should bet, okay? But here, you don't have to ask yourself that question anymore because you can give a free card because the texture works for you. So what can you do on this board 100% of the time? Check. If he happens to bet, that's awesome. You can check raise him. And if he happens not to bet, you just don't care. So that's a little tiny place where it looks different, right? So with the set, you got to be really careful about that, right? If you have a set of sixes here, you have to be like, okay, if I check, is this guy going to bet? If the answer is yes, okay, good, I can check. If the answer is no, I got a bet. Here, you're like, I don't care, I check. Looks like a check to me. Because you don't care what, what he does either way, right? Because the texture is working in your favor, right? So you can always give a free card because it's your free card, not his. Great. So the point of this is that by taking the proper conceptual line on the flop, right? you appear very confusing to your opponent without mixing it up. So if we look at, say, this board, right, whether you're holding ace, king of spades, or three sixes, right, if a guy bets into you, you're going to raise for completely different reasons, right? In the case of the sixes, you're like, I have the best hand. Oh, I don't want to make another decision. In the case of the ace, king, you're like, oh, I'd like to win with ace high, and I kind of want to see two cards. So they're totally different reasons, but you're doing the same thing. So if you bet, and if, you, if he bets and you raise, from that action, can your opponent de discern anything real about your cards? Not really, right? You could have the draw and you could have the set. He doesn't really know because you just did the same thing with either one of them and that's the pattern he's going to see. Did you have to mix it up in order to get that result? Closing thought, having gone through two of my seminars now. If you're playing the game right, both in poker and life, then you're constantly learning and changing and growing, right? 
because we learn things about our opponents, we learn things about our own game, we learn things about our, you know, the people we're relating to in life, whatever. So it's the nature of the game to change. So one thing you're going to be constantly called on to do is adapt, right? And that's what all these young kids are talking, oh, these old guys, they can't adapt. Well, if you're playing by rules, of course you can't adapt because you don't know how to change your rules. But if you're playing conceptually, you're naturally adapting, not just sort of globally over year to year, but in the moment from half an hour ago to now. Because, for example, if I'm playing in a home game and I come in at the beginning of the night when, and we've all come in at the same time and we're all fresh and everybody's come in and they're like, I'm going to play really well tonight. This is the night that I'm going to play well and I'm going to win. And I bet all of you have done this yourselves because I've done it. This, I'm not, I'm not going to screw up. I'm not going to go on tail. And everybody's trying to play their best at the beginning of the night. You should probably be playing differently against them then than six hours later when half of them are drunk and on tilt. <laughs> now you might want to make some different decisions against those guys, right? So it's not just about sort of globally adapting over year to year to year as the game has changed, you know, from five years ago to today, right? It's about changing in the moment within the way that people's mental states are in the game, eat from half hour to half hour, hand to hand. If a guy just lost a huge pot, you know, I suggest you take that into consideration in the way that you think he's going to act towards you in the next hand. You always have to be, you know, be really agile, right? So keep doing that and keep making excellent decisions based on the information that you have at hand at that moment because it's just, it's not hard to play great poker and it's just really not hard to have a really fantastic life if you do that and you always adapt. So all I have to do is decide to do that. That's it.